My guest today is Cal Abel. I served uh, 10 years in the Navy um, from 99 to 2009 uh, aboard two different submarines. My last one, I was the the uh, chief engineer on, so I had a lot of fun driving boats around in the water. And after I got out of the Navy, I had kind of a uh, struggle with transitioning to civilian life uh, and uh, worked for a little bit at Sequoia Nuclear Power Plant as a, uh, what they called an instant SRO, an instant senior reactor operator. So I do have a, a like minute amount of commercial nuclear experience. Um, and then from there, I was on the side of doing the instant SRO program. Uh, I started going into doing uh, research on energy policy and policy analysis. Uh, I was looking at the uh, Waxman and Markey climate bill. I did a full analysis and breakdown of that. Uh, in terms of how the price of carbon would work, how the different subsidies would work, and the different uh, consequences with the policy alternatives, which we can talk about later. And I ended up presenting that at the American Nuclear Society uh, for the 2010 annual meeting. Uh, it was a very interesting presentation. Uh, in the midst of doing that, I found out that, you know, it's not a technical or economic reason why we're not building nuclear power, it's a policy reason as far as why we're not. And so I decided to go back to school to learn more about public policy. So I thought, well, you know, I'm a nuclear engineer. I already have a master's in nuclear engineering. Um, why don't I just go ahead and get my PhD in nuclear engineering and minor in public policy? Because I know I can get into the nuclear engineering program. Not sure if I can get into the public policy program. So I went to Georgia Tech, did exactly that. Uh, while I was there, I was at Tech from 2010 to 2018. And uh, I came up with a concept that I called nuclear thermal energy storage, uh, which is taking a sodium fast reactor, uh, Prism, I'm a, I'm a big sodium fast reactor fanboy, have been since the 90s. Ever since they killed the IFR, I've been a fanboy. Um, and did, uh, and saw a way of being able to isolate the NRC's regulatory purview and uh, to strictly the nuclear island. And so I did that through creating a technology, uh, uh, which is just a thermal energy storage. It's basically hooking up a hot salt tank and a cold salt tank to the reactor. And that, so we talk more about that. Uh, and then while I was at tech, I ended up starting up my own company, got into Bitcoin, um, used Bitcoin to start up my own company, uh, which is Signal Power and Light. And we are an energy and um, uh, governance company. So we have a zone in Honduras called our ZA Arcadia, uh, the Orchid ZA. And um, we had a crazy idea that if you supply people with good rules, so using uh, common law and cheap energy, hence signal power and light, so old school kind of power company name, that uh, they will do well for themselves. So we started that, working on that in 2013. Uh, the ZA went live in August of 2018, and uh, it's been an interesting political trip as well with that. Um, much to our chagrin, we weren't able to get the power plant built, um, but we are now, I am now working with, I'm the chief technology officer of the company, and uh, we're working on um, revitalizing and adapting some technology from the 1930s called the Carrick process, which is a, a high temperature retort of coal. So about 650 degrees Celsius, you heat the coal up, you get uh, per, per ton of coal, you get three quarters of a ton of semi-coke out of it. Uh, a barrel of oil and about 200 megajoules of uh, syngas. And so uh, we are using that as our entree into uh, liquid fuel production. So that's kind of the lowest cost, easiest way in. And then hopefully, and God willing, be expanding from there. And hopefully also along the way is uh, integrating the synthetic liquid fuels uh, with uh, a nuclear reactor, which is what my ultimate goal is, which is what I figured out as being a solution to climate in 2010. So it's kind of like I keep on going back to that. That that 2010 was a 
was a big year for me where everything kind of stemmed from that. So that's, that's me in a nutshell. Yeah, I hate to put any pressure on you, but I, I see you as one of the most interesting guys in the world. It's just incredible, the stuff you're doing. Um, B.F. Randall compared your work on Natrium to Ben Franklin's work on the Franklin stove, right? That it's, it's that big of a deal. Um, is that coming close to fruition in the real world now? There was a, uh, they were building I it? I think so. Something? Yeah. Yeah, they're in Kemmerer, Wyoming. They're, they're, they're going to be building it. I have no affiliate, just for the record, I have no affiliation with Natrium. So, um because I'm such a Prism fanboy, uh, I, and just by the sh by sheer happenstance, I happen to know uh, personally and was friends with uh, the guy who's in charge of uh, Prism at G. Hitachi Nuclear, Eric Lowen. He was a former president of the American Nuclear Society right around the 2010 timeframe. Uh, he was a PhD student at Wisconsin when I was an undergrad and a uh, and master's student there. So, he and I kept in touch over the years. He's been a mentor of mine for, well, he's been a mentor of mine for my entire, since I've known him. Uh, and so I just kept in touch with him and said, hey, uh, I'm doing this project here. Would you be interested in being on my committee? Uh, he said, yes. And so I uh, created Natrium uh, because I was, I used my GI Bill for my uh, PhD. I felt like, my work should be in the public domain because I was effectively funded by, uh, by the public. So I put my work in the public domain as a result of that. And uh, so it's uh, put it out in Creative Commons. And, whoa. And so I put it out in the Creative Commons, and so that was how that got created. I, but I don't see it as, as how P.F. Randall describes it. It was just... Uh, something I was working on and just kind of happened. I, I don't. Uh, there is a possibility of a future though, where this technology could be dropped in at all of the coal fired electricity generation plants, right? That was, just, that's the whole goal of it. So the problem with nuclear is, is, is the regulations behind it. It's not the technology. And so I, I had to create a technology that limited what the regulator could regulate. So the regulator's there for reactor safety. And, and the predominant thing with reactor safety from operations comes down to reactor kinetics. So the kinetics, um, and kinetics is, a, is a, I guess, an engineering way of describing how things change. So like changing reactor power and the, the changing of the, the neutron population within the core. Uh, that's really what we're talking about kinetics is how, like how the rate of the reaction occurs. So with, and it is fundamental, like I, I, everything that the regulator stems around stems around and comes down to kinetics from, from the practical operational standpoint. And so I knew that if I could separate the kinetics of the demand, the, the production of the electricity, what we care about, or the, or the use and application of the process heat, uh, which is really what, what, where nuclear comes into play. Uh, if we could separate that from the kinetics of the reactor, then there's a clear wall and a technical justification to say, hey, regulator, get in your sandbox, man. And so what I did was to do that, and then in my dissertation, I tried to break it. And I couldn't break it. And so that was my justification to say, look, this is a, on, um, you can say, and I, and I define the safety boundary as the, what I call the, the auxiliary uh, cooling system. I have some drawings in a, in a PDF I can bring up to show you kind of where I define the safety boundary. But I said, okay, on this side of the safety boundary, it's nuclear. Regulator, you regulate it. This side of the safety boundary, the reactor operators control the speed of the, the cold pumps, pumping the cold uh, salt to get hot and to heat it up in the reactor to uh, go into the hot tank. So the reactor operators control that, which affects kinetics. But that's all non-nuclear, and that's the extent of what the NRC has control over. Everything else from the, uh, 
the the hot tank on, no say. They have no say in that. And so I, I showed how that would work and and justified it. And so that was that was my creation. It was a so all sodium fast reactors have a an intermediate loop with it. I just replaced the intermediate loop. Uh, I kind of expanded it a little bit, made it a little bit bigger, added some a hot tank and a cold tank, changed it from being sodium to being salt. So the salt doesn't react with the steam and the salt doesn't react with the sodium. So it's kind of like a perfect inert uh, thing. So that got and simplified a lot of the reactor construction uh, because the previous prism iterations all had uh, sodium in these special steam generators. So you have sodium on one side of the tube and then water. Uh, so you have water on the inside, sodium on the outside. And they were like a double walled tube with this boil, uh, blow down system. I mean, you talk about a complex thing, uh, sodium water interactions are nothing to scoff at. So by putting the salt in there, you know, it kind of gets rid of that. So it's just, so it was just really just kind of expanding the, the, this, the intermediate system into something that was more inert, created this time delay. And then where I put the nuclear safety boundary was just, uh, it's basically like a little bypass loop so that in the event that you have a, uh, that you lose salt flow, that you can still use the salt for cooling. And uh, I called that the auxiliary cooling system and bam, that was my dissertation. So it wasn't, it wasn't like a big innovation, um, but it was a very targeted innovation. Okay. And uh, part of your idea was to look at the concentrated solar power, right? That's how. Yeah. So, some, I, yeah. Oh, man, those renewable people. We have spent so much money chasing down this renewable um, rabbit hole. And I was like, uh, they've got to have something in there that's worthwhile. And I don't know how I put two and two together, but one day it was just like, oh, there's this concentrated solar power thing. Well, it's about the same temperature as the reactors. Oh, and they've actually built these things. Huh. I was like, okay, so I just, I don't have to worry about the salt side of it. And that's already, I mean, Siemens has entire systems on them. Like, and that's pretty good. So the really only thing I need to focus on is on the nuclear side. Um, and that made and that made it a very defined problem. So selecting the materials and that kind of stuff, uh, selecting the heat exchanger design. I mean, it was it was a very simple engineering um, adaptation uh, to do. And uh, what I was tickled about was, so I defended in March of uh, 2018, uh, Glone, the head of G. Hitachi uh, for the Prism Reactor, uh, was on the committee, and. And after the fact, I found this out um, by talking with some people at uh, TerraPower as they started uh, detailed engineering on it in October of 2018. So in the span of about seven months from my defense, it went towards detailed engineering for commercial operation, and I did not publish anything. So it was just my defense, and it went from there. I was, I was just completely blown away by that. So do you think all the technical hurdles have been uh, surpassed and it's just a matter of making sure it works in Wyoming and then it's, yeah. uh, it's rolling it out everywhere? Or... Yeah. It's um, what I found in 2010 when I was looking at the, the Waxman Markey bill is the energy infrastructure that we have in this country and in the world for that matter, the existing energy infrastructure is absolutely massive. We have trillions upon trillions and upon trillions of dollars invested in that infrastructure. To wholesale want to change that out and to create a new infrastructure is so incredibly short-sighted and so unappreciative of the past action of our ancestors, of our parents, our grandparents, and our great-grandparents, uh, and their sacrifices and what they lived through to ignore that infrastructure and their creation. And so that if we are to honor uh, the legacy that we've been bequeathed and entrusted with for our children and our grandchildren, then we need to be respectful of that infrastructure and we need to seek to preserve it and to fight for it. 
And there's so much that's built upon uh, around this infrastructure. You have um, for a power plant, like in Kemmerer, Wyoming, I think it's like 500 people work in Kemmerer, Wyoming at that coal plant that's being repowered. Um, the utility was going to shut down the power plant and those people were facing losing a job. And now all they get to keep their job. It just, it changes just a little bit. It's just, it's tweaked just, just a little bit. So you get to use the physical infrastructure that's there. More importantly, with power plants, it is not just the value of the power plant. It's not just the physical infrastructure. It's in the environmental and regulatory permitting. To get a NERC permit for a new power plant is a five to 10 year process. This is just NERC, just to be able to connect to the grid. Five to 10 years of just regulatory hurdle after regulatory hurdle, just because. Not to mention, if you're building a nuclear reactor, you've got your work with the NRC, the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, you've got, I mean, it's insane. Then, if you have to dissipate the heat some way, oh, uh, then you've got the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service coming in uh, on top of the EPA. Uh, and it's like, wait, what, how, many different, how many different permits do you have to get in order to be able to build a power plant? And what's the timeline it takes to get that? So if you have that kind of base permits and you just do a targeted change out of your permit of basically just changing the heat source for one of these power plants, you reuse all that policy. That's political infrastructure. So you, you reuse as much of the physical infrastructure and as much of the political infrastructure as you have. And you'll be up and running and those communities will have their livelihood preserved. The other part of it... When I, when I was looking at that, that work from 2010 is, you, you know, it was like, oh gosh, it's the, the uh, what was it in 2017, the meme from the journalist was to the coal miners was learn to code. And, and I am, that is the most condescending and ignorant thing to tell somebody you have communities livelihood. And, and I'm, I am now officially a coal miner. I'm an MSHA certified coal miner. Uh, my company owns a uh, coal mine in Northern Alabama. So I'm like, I'm in the fossil fuel industry and, and next to nuclear and the next most probably regulated uh, 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 sector. So it is, and I got into it because of the, the research that I did is what I saw was you have this, this tremendous asset here um, this physical carbon that you can, you know, you hold a lump of coal in your hand. That's, that's carbon. The problem with coal is that we burn it. It is not valuable for its heat. What makes coal valuable is its carbon. And in 2010, what I realized that we could do is, why don't we just use the heat from a nuclear reactor to gasify and liquefy the coal and produce synthetic fuels and uh, carbon found out is that carbon monoxide and hydrogen, which are the products of, of synthetic fuels, form pretty much the entire basis of the entire, of the entire, and I mean entire chemical industry, carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And with those two compounds, you can build whatever molecule you want to build. And they do. And so that just kind of blows the top off of what coal can achieve and what nuclear can achieve. And so it was like, all right, so let's do this. And so I modeled that concept and showed that had we started, so this was in so all reference to 2005 levels to get below what 80% reduction from 2005 levels. So I took all the data from the EIA modeled it, and I showed that the price of electricity and the carbon-constrained economy, when you do the sodium fast reactor build-out, I hadn't at that point invented uh, what was to become natrium. Um, but so I was like, yeah, we can do this. So this was a, I have, uh, you know, pass the puck and I'll, I'll catch it later. And I ended up catching it, but that, so we repower those plants. And the price of electricity 
it goes up for a little bit because you have a price on carbon. But then the price of electricity, once you've built out and repowered all these coal plants and repowered all these combustion, combined cycle combustion turbine plants with nuclear, is that the price of power was the same in 2005, what it would be, uh, I think I ended up decarbonizing by about 2030, decarbonizing electricity sector by 2030. So by 2030, the price of electricity was the same as it was in 2005. With the, with the price of carbon that they had proposed in the bill. I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. And when I looked at the renewable scenario that they had proposed in there, the price of carbon was like ridiculous. It was like Germany stupid. Um, and then uh, about a year later, Germany came out with Energy Venda. And I'm like, man, you all are a bunch of idiots. And, uh, and, and true to form, the Germans with regards to Energy Venda have been a bunch of idiots. And so if there's any German listeners out there, Boom cough. I mean, seriously, stupid. Okay. My grandmother would call me that and I would tuck my tail in shame. So it was, so that was that kind of my realization of, okay, the policy isn't aligned with the reality uh, of what's going on here. And uh, the, so, I was talking about going back with that. So the price of power for nuclear is constrained, is constrained, but electricity isn't all of our energy use. And the bulk of our energy use actually comes around in um, uh, industrial applications and, and for process heat and in uh, transportation. It was transportation being the larger of the two. So I was like, wow. So if we can decarbonize as much of the industrial sector as we can with this process heat. Uh, we can then um, get some pretty big reductions. And then if we can find a way of, you know, kind of storing some heat from a nuclear reactor in some hydrocarbon bonds, we can help decarbonize the um, transportation sector. So when you look at synthetic fuels, if you capture all the carbon from that synthetic fuel process, so when when you're looking at like fissure trop sh synthesis, uh, the byproduct gas that you get off of that is carbon dioxide. Is this is where the green? This is where all the renewable stuff comes in. Is that in the solid um, electrolytic cell, solid oxide of electrolytic cells uh, (SOECs) um, that you can use the SOECs that they were going to be using for their green hydrogen to uh, turn carbon dioxide into carbon monoxide and oxygen. And so it's the same technology that they've been do doing, but you can use it to end up storing about 20% of the energy in your synthetic fuel comes from a nuclear reactor to drive that process. So you end up converting 100% of the carbon from the coal that you have into uh, synthetic um, uh, jet A, or synthetic diesel fuel, which as, as Brett um, rightfully admits to is kind of the lifeblood of the modern economy. So you create this synthetic fuel and 20% of the energy in that came directly from a nuclear reactor. So the, instead of having all these lithium ion batteries, why not just use a chemical battery instead? So hydrocarbon bonds are a great way of storing energy. So why not? store the energy there from a nuclear reactor. And so that reduces the carbon intensity because you're storing nuclear heat in chemical bonds. And so you effectively achieve in one fell swoop a 20% a, a reduction in carbon dioxide intensity in your transportation sector. And not only that, you have complete control of your entire liquid fuel and transportation fuel infrastructure. So I just did some back of the envelope calculations. The amount of coal that we mined in 2007 was enough to be able to replace the entire um, oil input into the U.S. economy under this, under this type of scenario. So you want energy independence? Okay, let's do energy independence. And it begins with nuclear and it begins with coal. It begins with a drill baby drill and we can all do it. Now, on the oil side, it gets kind of fun too, is because when you look at the chemical reactions for oil, 
they're all in the 500 degrees Celsius range and under. You have some that go up into the 600 degrees Celsius range, but for those, you can get most of the way there, boost a little bit of oxygen in, and then you get it the rest of the way there. So nuclear could um, directly with these sodium fast reactors, natrium, be used for uh, chemical refining, for, for oil production. So instead of burning all the hydrocarbons that we have in order to produce the process heat to refine oil, you use the heat from a reactor to refine the oil. And then you have extra hydrocarbons that come out of that. So the problem with hydrocarbons is the same problem that we have with coal, is that we burn it. So we need to just stop burning it. It's much more valuable as the other things. And heat from a nuclear reactor is like cheap. It's probably the, it's the, it's the least expensive form of primary energy that we have available to us. So the, when you look at kind of, and this is even with an open fuel cycle, from the EIA numbers, the, the variable fuel costs uh, for a reactor, uh, you're looking right at around $20 per megawatt hour. I mean, it is $18, $20 a megawatt hour um, just for the heat for the reactor. Now, what gets expensive with nuclear is the capital costs on top of that. But where does the capital cost come from? Well, the capital cost comes from all the different regulatory requirements that we have on top of nuclear which are myriad and self-contradicting. Like you can't be in compliance with the regulations because the regulations contradict themselves. So to do anything nuclear is awful. So why do we have, why is nuclear so expensive? It's because the regulations were made to make it expensive. Uh, and that was politically motivated uh, mainly in the 1970s uh, to prevent the uh, implementation of nuclear energy in the US. So. Uh, we have we have only ourselves to blame for why we're not doing any of this. So, I I can't take credit for any of the stuff that I've been talking about because this has all been talked about and thought about and done before, all of it. Um, back in the 1970s, when the last energy crisis, um, there were, and I found this out a little bit after the fact, was when I tried to patent my idea of of uh, nuclear coal gasification, uh, I found probably about 15 conflicting patents associated with it that had all prior art associated with it. And they were all from the 1970s. So there's nothing new under the sun. The problems that we're trying to solve are the same problems that we've had in the past. It's just that we've been ignoring the solutions to them. And so uh, I guess that's kind of what I'm on the mission to do now is to help people to understand how to, what to ignore and what to pay attention to, so. I think elsewhere you've talked about uh, the idea of taking an existing coal plant near an airport and uh, dropping in natrium and then continuing to deliver coal to that plant yep. and using natrium to create the jet fuel and just piping it over to the airport. How close are we technically to being able to do that? And do it right now. So there's a, so the idea that I had and I presented this at Coal Gen uh, in 2012, was there was a um, <clears throat> was I, I took the idea of uh, Noonan, Noonan, Georgia. There's a coal plant down in Noonan, Georgia. Uh, it's about uh, 1,200 uh, megawatts uh, electric. And it is about 20 miles, no, 25, 25 miles or so away from the Atlanta Hartsfield Airport. And the idea that I had was Hey, Southern Company, why don't we repower that reactor with natrium? Overbuild the nuclear so that we have that excess heat to be able to gasify and liquefy the coal. And we keep the coal coming there because we have the rail infrastructure, the coal handling infrastructure, all that infrastructure there. So we keep everything going in. We build a whole bunch of nuclear in there. We keep producing electricity that we need. And then we take that excess heat from the reactor and use that to gasify coal. And you can selectively produce jet A from Fisher Trops using, um, uh, you have to use a cobalt catalyst and it's low temperature. So it's the low temperature Fisher Trops um, selectively produces, um, I think, at about 80% in that diesel. And you can play with the ratios with the 
the diesel to the to the jet a slash kerosene uh, level and then you put that in a pipeline and you send that up to the world's busiest airport and now you have basically green jet fuel which is 20 percent nuclear so all the airplanes flying in and out of atlanta hartsfield would be 20 percent nuclear power and so that was uh so i pitched that idea to the coal industry they kind of looked at me like i had three heads so i don't i, I don't know i feel a bit like cassandra sometimes uh, maybe, maybe I'll just read this tweet that you just retweeted from B.F. Randall. The annual ura uranium market, mining enough fuel to power civilization nearly six times current energy consumption, is valued at $790 million. The cow dung fuel market in India is valued at $4 billion. Let that sink in. Uh, any other comments on that? That's pretty amazing. When he, when he explained that, that completely blew my mind. So where he's getting that six times number uh, came from was a, a different thread that uh, Nick Turin started and then I, then I added to is in the globally each year, we mine 48,000 metric tons of uranium, okay? That uranium, really only 4% of it actually gets used uh, and the rest, uh, not even 4% of it, uh, because we have to enrich it. It's like not even, I would say probably not even a percent of it actually goes to actually making energy. So that's how inefficient the current light water fuel cycle is that we only use maybe 1% of the total, uh, without having to do the enrichment calculations. There's a whole thing with uh, separative work units and tails and we just kind of guessing less than 1% of the uranium that we mine um goes to actually producing electrical power the other 99 percent is either tied up in spent nuclear fuel or is sitting as uranium tailings from the enrichment process and or as depleted uranium and then while well, that feeds the the war machine that's not really the machine that we want to be feeding with the depleted uranium so if we take fast reactors, and again, this is why I'm such a fast reactor fanboy, is that fast reactors allow us to be able to use all of the uranium. If we used fast reactors and we used all of the uranium, we mine today enough uranium to power the world, the entire world, from not just electricity, but I'm talking from electricity, transportation and process. If you add up all that energy, the amount of energy that we can extract from that uranium is six times current global consumption, okay? That's pretty unreal. So there's some economic growth that can happen within that. Just within that little bit of uranium, that 48,000 metric tons that we're mining. It was like, okay, so that's, the, that's that kind of perspective. Brett pulled, put a, a number on, on that of that mining market is $750 million. Like, okay, that's kind of a reasonable number for that amount of mining as far as what that market is. That makes sense. And then that number for the cow dung, cow dung. Cow dung in what will become the most populous country in the world. And is probably one of the most up and coming countries in the world. Its cow dung market is six times, over six times, almost eight times. Yeah, seven, uh, six, divided by seven, almost nine times, almost nine times the size of the uranium market. And the uranium market can power the world six times over. So it's like, Energy is value, and I mean that very technically in an economic sense. Um, and this whole energy thing kind of got me, and I got looking at policy. I also got looking at economics, too, to try to understand economics. Um, I just published a, a paper in the Philosophical uh, Transactions of the Royal Society, A, uh, a paper called... Um, 
the quantum foundations of utility and value. And in that paper, um, I show that economic utility is the von Neumann entropy of um, a society and that value is the Hamiltonian operator. And so for you physicists out there, you'll know exactly what the Hamiltonian is. Uh, the Hamiltonian is energy. And uh, that energy is value. And I mean that in a very precise technical sense. So if we're spending six billion on cow dung and we're spending 750 million to use 1%, less than 1% of enough energy to power the world six times over, our money is not being valued appropriately. So that, that, that money, basically money's value comes down to how much energy you can buy with it. And with uranium, uh, uranium makes money very, very valuable because uranium is very cheap to get and very cheap to convert into useful energy, exergy as we call it in engineering. Um, so, yeah. Uh, in your I, idea, I mean, with that Brett Sumber there blew my mind. I was like. <laughs> uh, in your ideal world, if you're, we're using uranium to power a VLCC ships, very large crude carrier ships, uh, how would that work? Would liquid fuel be involved at all, or would you put Natrium just right on the ship and not even use liquid fuel to power it? Um, in all honesty, I've thought about this some. Um, I had a tweet thread where I talked about using uh, molten thorium reactors because you don't have uh, the transuranic buildup on a thorium fuel cycle. Uh, the problem with the thorium fuel cycle however, and especially on a ship, is that uh, you produce very pure uranium-233. Uh, and uranium-233 is weapons grade. And it's very easy on a ship to just, you know, offload some of that uranium-233 kind of when you're on the high seas and nobody's looking. Um, so I don't think uh, liquid, liquid fuel now would probably be best. Um, perhaps like a triso. Um, a uh, good friend of mine, uh, Rod Adams, had a uh, he had it was a I'm trying to remember his the name of it, but it was effectively a little triso uh, nitrogen cooled um, reactor where they had triso fuel uh, in there, and they got to very high temperatures um, with a gas cooled reactor. Uh, I would probably shift that to triso fuel with a salt um, primary. And then use a salt air heat exchanger to heat a uh, Brayton cycle, uh, just like a jet engine, um, to provide the heat for propulsion. So that way you're not having to deal with water. You're just sucking in air, heating it up with this nuclear reactor, and then blasting the hot air out. And because you've got the you've got that that loop in there, is that the air is never exposed to a neutron flux, so it can never become radioactive. So it's a, uh, a very effective way of being able to isolate uh, the heat source. So you can get a very, really insanely high energy density from nuclear doing that. And the Braden cycle in terms of energy density of a power conversion system is the most dense that's out there. So you can, it can be done. Um, the funny thing is, is the idea that I had for two in that one uh, was based off of the uh, uh, aviation nuclear power plant, uh, the ANP project, where they put a reactor in a uh, uh, a Cold War era bomber, and then that reactor was a salt cooled reactor, uh, heated up the air with the air salt heat exchanger, and then blasted the hot air out in the Brayton cycle. So, again, nothing's new under the sun, and uh, Brayton cycles are used extensively on onboard ships, particularly warships in the U.S. Navy and other navies in the world. The LM-2500 is a, is a massive, massive, massive power plant. And uh, you could very easily repower all those tankers out there. And uh, all, the, all the VLCCs, all the container ships 
repower them with that type of reactor and bam, what'd you do? You just made shipping not constrained by fuel anymore. So those things can book. Um, so what was it? The, the Enterprise, the USS Enterprise, uh, I think it had a top speed of something like 65 knots with its uh, eight nuclear reactors. It's just an obscene amount of speed on that thing. Uh, with those long ships, they have very efficient hulls. So in all those container ships, all those crewed ships, all those ships are very large. So you put enough power on that thing, man, it's like it, <laughs> you make that thing fly. It's, it's like the, the joke in flying is um, if you put enough thrust on a brick, you can make a brick fly. So put enough thrust on those ships and man, those things will fly through the water. Uh, I was so, going to bring up... No, I, all these, all these things are all out there. It's just, we just got to do it. But the, the problem is us. Yeah, I mean, do you think that uh, we can get the public behind this type of thing? Or do you think they've been watching The Simpsons too much and they think of three-eyed fish when they think of uh, any sort of nuclear power? I think there's a massive shift going on right now. So uh, there was a stat, and I can't remember where it's from. So... um I just saw it on Twitter. It was saying uh, that nuclear power was in uh, in the U.S. in 1983 was 49 percent supported, and today that's at 76 percent um, are in favor of nuclear power. the The problem that you have it, it comes down to political and established interests. So let me give an example here. So uh, all those production and investment tax credits that the renewables have are always set to expire after five or seven years. Well, the reauthorization of those bills comes up and those production and investment tax credits always manage to get, keep on getting extended. They never seem to, they never seem to go away. Uh, and it's very interesting that the the people who are involved with this are uh, people like Warren Buffett. Mid-continent energy uh, is very proactive about ensuring that they are getting their investment tax credits. And I think they even sued somebody. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I, I wish I had it more in my head as far as it was, but as I recall, um, they had sued somebody over the loss of their investment tax credit and were awarded damages because they lost their investment tax credit. So the only thing that's keeping the renewables alive is those investment and production tax credits. Get rid of those, it's dead. The entire renewable industry is dead. We are not going to see it die because of the number of people who are lined up at the trough of getting those tax credits and the political sway and political authority that they have in the country. Uh, Warren Buffett, another, uh, happens to own BNSF through Berkshire Hath Hathaway. Uh, BNSF uh, is the main railway that transports oil out of the Bakken. But they were gonna be putting in a pipeline in South Dakota, but that pipeline all of a sudden managed to run into some serious opposition about environmental concerns. I wonder why that was. I mean, how, how many times do we need to see these games played out over time to know what the motive is? It's not about the environment. It's not about protecting indigenous land or people. It is about money. It is about getting that money from the trough, it's making money without having to make money. And that's the game that they're playing. So I wanted to bring up this uh, quote or about you that you see the entire global warming policy complex as a scam to give away tax dollars and create fake assets for traders to manipulate. I like yes. that. Oh, it's true. <laughs> oh. Okay. So here's so here's some so here's some fun stuff for you. So coal mining, 
Uh, we have to post massive, massive bonds on um, reclamation. So we have to reclaim to the topology that's supposed to be there. And uh, there's different phases that you have to go through. So you have phase one reclamation, phase two, phase three, and then you get your bond released. Well, they, phase one is pretty simple. Uh, that happens usually within about six to nine months after you finish um, uh, reclaiming the land uh, as you get that bond money released. So, uh, so for a reasonably sized mine, so uh, we, have, we have a mine, our phase two, our bonding is like somewhere around, you know, a couple million dollars uh, on a mine. And it's nothing, it's not cheap to tie up a couple million dollars in bonding. Well, um, what you can do is if you put that land to commercial use, you don't have to have it bonded. And so what we're looking at is um, elephant grass, is that we get massive tax credits and carbon credits and carbon offsets for planting elephant grass. And that releases our bond money immediately. So, I mean, it's all these, you have these policy roadblocks come up and then you have these crazy incentives where in the state of Georgia, I live in Georgia, where we are cutting down our force, literally, we are cutting down our force to pelletize them and to send them off to Europe. So coal allowed us to reforest pretty much the entire U.S. The U.S. has more trees in it now than it did, I think, back to about the 1870s or 1860s. Uh, so we have reforested the U.S. to an extent that we haven't seen uh, for almost 150 years uh, in, in, the, in the country. And we are now chopping down our forests so that the Europeans can burn them here. But so, oh, it's ridiculous. We can use that elephant grass from that coal to sell to Europe. So it's all a game. It literally is just a game. When you sit down and you look at how these things are structured, how these incentives are structured, it is just a game. And they are, it is, it is a rigged game. So all these carbon credits, oh, you can put a price on that, which means that you can trade it. It's a commodity that doesn't really exist. It's like these indulgences that uh, Martin Luther uh, opposed in, uh, um, when he posted his 99 theses. Okay? So, so we had these carbon indulgences. I'll call them for what they are. We have these carbon indulgences that we can trade amongst ourselves to make ourselves feel better and be aligned with the with uh, Gaia uh, and and with the with the gods of the environment and uh, and and make ourselves feel good when we're flying around in our uh, private jets to lecture people about what they that they should be consuming less energy. Uh, we're green because we have our offsets. Okay. Not naming any names, John Kerry. So, so we have these offsets, we have these credits, we have these things where we're cutting down these forests that we've taken generations, generations to regrow. To make Europeans feel better about turning off their nuclear reactors because they're fucking idiots. I'm sorry. Germany's a fucking idiot. Marcon in France is a fucking idiot for wanting to turn off the nukes and to try to limit. It's political. It is all political. It is political and is political about the tax credits. It is political and about the market share. It's seen as being this zero-sum game. If we take if we expand energy use in the world, 
the market share for fossil fuels will collapse. I will tell you that flat out. If we grow energy with nuclear in the world, the market share of fossil fuels will collapse 100%. However, if you look in terms of absolute production of energy from fossil fuels, it will only increase because of the demand for plastics and transportation fuels and for uh, pharmaceuticals and all that. All that stuff comes from fossil fuels, from carbon. That's where, that's where the value of carbon is. So in absolute terms, fossil fuel production and consumption will increase in that high energy, large nuclear world. But the market share will collapse. And what that means is that they lose their pricing authority and their pricing power. They become just another commodity that's out there. And all this stuff is about pricing control. They don't care about the world and making people's lives better. Energy makes people's lives better. If you don't think that energy makes people's lives better, go live in the woods and see how long you manage to live because you won't. Energy drives our lives. Energy created modernity. So energy is fundamental to human life and, 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 and flourishing. So you take that away or you limit that, you're limiting human flourishing. So yeah, these, oh God. So yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. It's just, it, it's no. like, I can't, it, I, we are so off on what our objective is with energy in terms of political discourse because the conversation and the trends of the conversation, so the language that we use in the conversation excludes the role of energy in creating human flourishing so that it becomes constrained to this kind of market share notion and that the established interests who have lined up at the trough, either through the use of the State Department and the military to uh, enforce and control their market share, oil majors, who have used the uh, environmental regulations to ensure that they have market share. Uh, oh, again, BNSF, sulfur. BNSF is one of the largest real companies for bringing low sulfur lignite out of the Powder River Basin. So Warren Buffett, again, man, he's looking out for your welfare. It's that type of thing of where they're ensuring their own special carve out, where that they are guaranteeing demand for, for their service by limiting the choices that, that other people have. That's the sort of thing that we have to get past. Uh, and we have to change that discourse. So, and I think I'm starting to see more of that in the nuclear community is changing that, that discourse to that. I'm starting to see that with people outside of the nuclear community. Uh, I just had a conversation yesterday with a whole bunch of Bitcoiners. And uh, Bitcoiners uh, as a group, uh, and I'm, I've been a Bitcoiner since 2012, so uh, pretty much almost since the beginning, um, well, within the first, what, four years. Um, Bitcoiners as a whole understand the connection of energy to value because in a proof of work currency like Bitcoin, the value of Bitcoin is measured in the energy used to mine it. And um, I have a paper on that as well. Um, that's part of the reason why I went down all of these different rabbit holes to the depth that I did to try to understand them was because that was what I, what I had to do. Um, 
but Bitcoiners intuitively know that energy is value. And so uh, they, I would say, there's more of a group tend to be more pro-energy um, than not. There are exceptions to that, but generally they tend to be very pro-energy. Uh, so and you start to see that sort of thing there. So I think we're starting to, to see that shift in the policy discussion. It's funny, it's, it's reading, I read this paper from the 1950s and it was written by a guy who I know, um, he was probably in his 50s when he wrote it. So he was born around the turn of the century um, and he lived through not having electricity. And that push that we had in the U.S. for rural electrification. My dad, for example, I have pictures of my dad plowing the field in the 1920s and 1930s with a horse. Or, sorry, no, no, in the 1940s, the pictures from like uh, 40, 42 uh, of him as a teenager plowing the field with a horse during World War II. Okay. Yes, we were still using horsepower, literally, for farming. And the people who lived through that, who had to use their physical work, their muscles, in order to be able to make things happen, understand work, understand the value of making an engine do the work for you or making a motor do the work for you. And you just push a switch or operate a hydraulic lever. They understand that value and they knew it. And we have become so arrogant that we have forgotten it and shame on us. And so we, because we have forgotten the gifts that we've been given, we're going to be cursed to lose them just as, as, as Europe is. So we can wake up and realize the gifts that we have and embrace them and appreciate them for what they are so that we can be caretakers of them to pass them on. We're just here for a little bit. And we can't afford to have stupid, short-sighted, selfish policy dictate what we're doing. So unfortunately, energy is very political. Um, I came to a realization that um, in, a, in another life, I have, I have many lives, I was a I, I had considered myself a communist. And I, so this is like right around college time. And I think we all kind of go through that little phase. So uh, I'm a recovering communist. Um, and that uh, thinking that there was a need to control the capitalist means of production. Okay. Well, you can control it directly through um, policy. Uh, through effectively the force of a gun like the Soviets did and the Chinese. Or you can control it through energy. And so the modern left has gotten very wise to the role of energy in the economy. And by controlling energy production, by restricting energy, by saying that less energy is good, they're controlling the capitalist means of production. 100%. It's why when you peel back, so the joke in, in Latin America, because of the, I do a lot of work in, in Latin America, the joke that they have for the environmentalists, they call them sandias. And sandia is a watermelon in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And it's green on the outside and red on the inside. And, and the modern environmental movement, particularly the NGOs, are all sandias. It's green on the outside, but man, it's red as hell on the inside. So it's a, and it's not the Republican red, that's the communist red. You know, like the Soviet flag, the Chinese flag, Democratic Republic of Korea. Yeah. Cuba. Well, not really Cuba. Cuba's got blue in there. But so you've got all this red, big red motifs. So yes, uh, red is communism. So yeah, they are all. So making that connection and going, okay, communists really aren't concerned about 
people, they're concerned about control. And so, well, when we look at all that policy, what does it come down to? It's control. It's not about people or their welfare, or, you know, worrying if grandmother's going to die because she can't regulate her body temperature and you're telling her that she has to turn her heat down or you turn her heat off uh, for a certain amount of time because you turned off all your nuclear reactors and uh, you listened to Gerhard Schroeder and, and you uh, went with uh, all this Russian gas and implemented this stupid policy called Energy Venda. Well, you're killing grandma. Literally, you're killing grandma. The, the cold-induced deaths are, are significantly higher, even with just a little bit of change. Robert Bryce talked about that in his uh, recent, uh, recent uh, interview with uh, Jordan Peterson. Yeah, they're killing grandma. They don't care about grandma. They don't care about the value that she adds to her family. They don't care about people. It's control. Not only is it control, it's what they can skim off on the side. It's about the kickbacks. It's about the special privileges. It's about the revolving door. You implement some good policy, you'll get hired. You get hired, you'll get some stock options that you'll get that you know are going to go up because, and you put that policy into effect. So it's this perverse set of incentives, and we've, we've got we've to gotta break it. We have to wake up to it. So energy is freedom. You want to be free? Have lots of energy. I mean, seriously, if you have the ability to be able to access an unlimited amount of energy, you can do whatever the hell you want to do. You want to leave the planet? Go for it. it takes energy. So when we get rich enough as a society, we're going to leave this rock. So the point is, well, ultimately for me, is to get humanity off this rock so that we can spread life throughout this galaxy as a big objective. You talk about pie in the sky. I grew up watching Star Trek and, you know, colonization of space. Hell yeah. That's our manifest destiny is not to be stuck here. But if we limit ourselves in energy, we sure as hell are going to be stuck here. And we're going to be stuck here because we listen to a bunch of Luddites. The neo-Luddites are, are, are in full force. So what, what's the future that you want? Do you want the future where we suffer in privation because we listen to people who said that energy was bad for us? Or do we embrace our energy-dense future and start pushing the boundaries of what we can achieve as humanity? What destiny do we want to achieve? What future do we want to embrace? Embrace it. Pick. You have to choose. And doing nothing is a choice. Doing nothing is staying where we are. So make a choice. I guess that's how I kind of look at it. Fantastic. We're coming up to the end of our hour here. Do you have any other points you'd like to make before we go ahead and wrap up? No. <laughs> I mean, I pretty much, I think, covered everything. Or I made a complete ass out of myself and... um uh, have successfully managed to torch my company. So, you know, one of the two, I mean, it's, well, we'll figure it out. So either you see me as, uh, as, uh, as a sort of a person who's trying to help humanity and to build a brighter future, you see me as a threat. And uh, so I know some people are going to disagree with what I said or parts of what I said. Uh, some are going to probably be turned off by how I said things. But what I would suggest to those people is sit down, do the analysis yourself, crunch the numbers. It doesn't, it's not, being able to figure out how to put the numbers together actually isn't that difficult. It's just everything in physics is just a ratio. Everything's a ratio of something else. So it's just a matter of finding those ratios and there's enough stuff out there. And when you sit down and you do that and you look at it and you ask yourself, why is it this way? What possibly could it be that's causing this? And I think probably the most powerful motivation that we have as human beings is our self-interest. And so if you can provide an explanation that 
that that gives a reasonable thing for self interest. For example, Warren Buffett, using him again. I mean, he's a great, great, great example. Is that as a result of self interest, if you can come up with um, an explanation that that's that's what you what you should follow. So. I don't say trust what you hear. Prove it for yourself. Don't believe me? Think I'm full of it? Sit down and do the analysis. I've been looking at this for probably, this particular problem for about 15 years. And um, it's changed the entire direction of my life. If I care about human beings, and I do, then my commitment is to increasing their access to energy as much as I can. I created a company to do that. I created technology and then gave it away to do that. So that's if that's what you're about, then we can walk this path together. If that's not, then stand by. It's not going to be an easy one. Because I'm not going to, I'm not going to back down, and I think people are getting tired of that, and I want a different alternative. All right. So thanks again. This is really good stuff. Uh, I can't wait to get it published and get some feedback on it. So thank you. All right. Thanks, Tom. We'll talk to you later. Yeah. Goodbye. Cheers.